And with me today, I have Moon Duchin. She is a professor of mathematics and a senior fellow at the Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University. Moon, thank you so much for being with us. Pleasure to be here. Excellent. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do um, as it pertains to the world of redistricting? Sure. So I'm a mathematician by training and I study geometry in particular. Um, and I got really interested in redistricting not that long ago uh, in 2016. Uh, I was teaching a class on voting theory and then started to think about all the different ways that my interests in, in math, but also in civil rights could kind of come together in the redistricting problem. So um, at the beginning, I was thinking like a good geometer about shapes. And so, you know, it's a widespread, you know, dearly held belief that what's wrong with redistricting really comes down to like ugly shaped districts and that those are like our best flags of uh, some sort of abusive intent um, in redistricting. So I got into it through thinking about district shape and the interest just grew from there. And so now I run a lab uh, based at Tisch College at Tufts that has really interdisciplinary work. There's math, there's data science, there's computing, but also geography, policy, kind of all coming together to think about interventions in redistricting and the time you know, is perfect right now. We're waiting for the new census data drop. And then all these lines around the country are gonna be redrawn and we're on the task. And so it seems like you are probably the, the most qualified person to ask a question we get asked a lot, which is why can't we just let a computer do it? Oh, good. I love that question. <laughs> please, please don't just let a computer do it is my first answer to that question. So, I mean, I think I'm definitely deeply invested in the idea that computers can be helpful for redistricting, but what they can do for you basically is take, you know, redistricting is governed by this patchwork of rules. And some of those rules are very precise, like you have to balance the population across the districts. And some of the rules are really fuzzy, like communities matter, right? And the, the way that a computer can help is to, to sort of, if you can take some of those rules and you can turn them quantitative, then you can get computers to sample alternative plans. So they can give you, a, I like to call this the shape of the universe. They can, they can kind of tell you what all the different alternatives might look like, give you a representative view of all the possibilities, but the computer's not gonna pick the best one for you. I think that's a, that's a misunderstanding also widely held that redistricting is essentially like an optimization problem that you know what you're looking for and you just need to find the best one. Actually, I can tell you from years of like full-time research that redistricting isn't anything like an optimization problem. It's a balancing priorities problem. Um, there's not like what computer scientists like to call a single objective function. Um, and so if you don't have one single objective, computers are not able to find the best. Instead, it, it gives you kind of a sense of trade-offs and it shows you what's possible it shows you what's really extreme. Um, and by kind of banning the things that are the most extreme by like sort of expelling the outliers, what you're left with is a lot of plans that, that are kind of contenders for balancing the priorities well. But people are always gonna have a role thinking through those priorities, putting them back in human terms and thinking about how they trade off. So on the front end and the back end, it sounds like you need human involvement um, to turn those fuzzy factors into yeah. quantitative measurements um, and then to determine which map has met all the balancing act requirements. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? What role do people need to play in this process? Well, that's great. I love that. You're absolutely right. There's this front end role um, where you operationalize the rules. That's what that's in kind of technical speak. When you take something out of like English or legalese, and you try to make it legible to a computer or even forget about a computer. You just try to turn it into something that has a clear kind of threshold. Like this is not allowed and this is allowed. Um, that's, that's operationalizing. That's taking something vague and making it precise in a particular way. So that's always gonna be a deliberative process, right? And what's really interesting in the Supreme Court last, last cycle said in that, big kind of bombshell Rucho case um, said, you know, we, the, the, the sort of federal judiciary, we don't want to think about um, partisan gerrymandering for a while. But you know what, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be thought about. Now we push it to the states. 
Um, and we look to the states to come up with their own rules, with their own mechanisms, with a commission structure as appropriate. And you know, this this is this idea, this kind of laboratories of democracy idea, is really powerful in American history. You'll have a lot of different states doing things a lot of different ways, and uh, look to see what works well. And so that, that's how I think about the role of the computer. It helps you model the problem. So where the modeling steps in is you have a candidate set of rules, and then you can look at how those rules have consequences. So you know, one way that we've looked at this in my lab is to try to understand what are kind of like hidden proxies that might exist in the rules. For instance, we all think, you know, I alluded to before, one of the problems with, with redistricting is really ugly shaped districts. In the language of redistricting, those would be called not compact, right? And, you know, it's been kind of conventional wisdom for a long time that compactness rules hurt Democrats and people of color. That's just sort of out there in the ether as an idea that people have. And so we said, well, hey, Maybe that's true. It's not obvious why it would be, but maybe that's true. Let's model it, right? And you can do that with any kind of rule and any kind of hypothesis about its effects. You can say, okay, what if I really dial up the importance of this rule? How does that change the universe of valid plans? You could look at whether you should keep cities together or allow them to be split. You could look at what happens if you loosen the population balance just a little bit. Um, and so these are the kinds of modeling problems that groups like ours really love to sink our teeth into. So I hope I'm kind of painting a complicated picture of the role of the computer, because I think there it's, the idea is, you know, there are so many ways to, to create technically valid redistricting plans. Um, and the question is kind of, how do you best meet the goals of representative democracy within that space of possibility? Um, I was really interested in the Rucho case when it went up to the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Alito, was very thoughtful in some of his remarks in oral argument about the kind of algorithmic approach to understanding the possibilities. He said, you know, maybe you use a computer and what you learn is you might have, you know, hundreds of plans or maybe even a thousand that meet all the rules. And you know, my head exploded when, when I heard him say that because actually it's not a thousand, <laughs> it's not a trillion, it's like a Google, like one with a hundred zeros. <laughs> I mean, this space of possibilities is like, unthinkably immense. And that's where the computer comes in. Computers are much better at navigating those like vast, huge data science wildernesses than, than kind of humans can do on our own. You've done some work with Virginia in 2018 when the Bethune Hill ruling from the federal court um, demanded that 11 uh, majority, major majority minority districts be redrawn uh, because they had been decided, they'd been deemed to be a racial gerrymander. Um, there was a special session of the General Assembly to redraw those maps, and I know that you and your team crunched a lot of numbers on that. Um, can you tell us what you learned from that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think sort of in the public consciousness, people really associate gerrymandering talk with partisan gerrymandering, with Democrats and Republicans. Um, but Bethune Hill was really interesting for us to get involved in thinking about because there, as you say, it was all about racial gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And so the question there was, um, you know, the Voting Rights Act is still the law of the land, the, the VRA from 1965, which tells us that we have to provide opportunity for minority groups to elect candidates of choice. And that's, that's been, a, you know, quite a balancing act <laughs> over the 50 plus years uh, since it since its inception, to try to think about what it means to you know to have the opportunity to elect. Well, what do opportunity districts look like? Um, terms of art when people think about gerrymandering are packing and cracking, right? And so packing is the idea that um, if you were to try to minimize the influence of black voters, maybe you'd pack lots and lots and lots of black voters into a few districts. And you could sort of think of that as like wastefully high percentages from the point of view of securing representation. If you control 90% of the district, that's not needed for control. Um, and then if you pack voters into a few districts, then with the rest of the voters, you can crack or disperse them over the districts. And that's a way of really diluting the vote, of minimizing the strength of a group. So we took a look at Virginia's House of Delegates with just that question in mind, um, how much packing and cracking is going on in a map such as the one that had been put forward by the legislature. So 
the real problem there, and it's been a problem, you know, for the 50 plus years that the court has been involved in redistricting at all. The real problem is packing and cracking compared to what? What's the alternative, right? What's the baseline? That's the way that people have been putting it for decades. And so there again, we think that if a computer can give you a representative sample of lots of different ways to divide up Virginia, then it can give you a sense of how much the actual lived geography on the ground, where people live and where they cluster, how much is that driving the distribution that you see over the districts? It gives you that baseline, right? And if you can look at a plan and say, wow, this looks really different from what I saw when I was doing kind of a race neutral investigation of the districts, then you can say maybe, okay, maybe that's, that's a sign of intent, right? It's, it's similar to, to what the, the legal standards look like for understanding racial gerrymandering. It's disparate uh, results as a kind of indicator of, of intent. Um, and here's what we found. So we looked, at, we looked at Virginia, it's a really interesting state. Actually, here's one fun fact about Virginia, maybe not that widely known. So it, another piece of conventional wisdom is that just districting plans in general are disfavorable to, to Democrats and to people of color because they tend to be clustered in cities. And so the, the story goes, that means they pack themselves, right? Remember packing was having like wastefully high percentages. Well, you know, as, as law professor Pam Carlin once said, and I'll remember this phrase for the rest of my life, she said, Democrats like to huddle for warmth in the cities. <laughs> and so if they're all packed together by themselves, then of course they're packed in our districting plans. That's the logic, right? And so what people think is that even if you did totally neutral redistricting, it would tend to underrepresent Democrats and people of color. And we've now looked at a lot of different states and by and large, that, that is very often true. Um, until you're in a state with a very heavy Democratic majority, that's pretty often true. The exception, Virginia. <laughs> um, Virginia is a remarkable state from our modeling perspective because it's a state with close to 50-50 voting patterns recently and a pretty level playing field for redistricting. Um, it's, it's not the case that the, the natural political geography gives it a tilt one way or the other to, to Democrats or to Republicans, or to people of color or, uh, or to, to white voters. Um, and that makes it a, a great place to look for these kinds of outlier effects. So what we found, okay, that's a long preface coming back around to the question. What we found when we looked at Virginia in depth is that not only did the legislature's plan pack black voters well beyond what you'd see from a neutral plan. Well, you should maybe expect that because the Voting Rights Act told them to secure opportunity um, for, for, uh, for communities of color to elect candidates of choice. But in addition, what we found is that the packing was well past the level that you'd expect in order to secure effective representation. Okay, and the, the surprise was when we looked at all of the proposed plans that were coming up in that process from the Republican controlled legislature, from the Democratic caucus, and even from outside groups, they also tended to have pretty strong patterns of packing relative to what we thought was needed to secure effective representation. So all to say, you know, long-winded way of saying, um, I actually think these algorithmic techniques uh, are really helpful for the civil rights perspective, where you're trying to actually maximize the voice of people of color and other marginalized communities, because what they show you is kind of places to look for opportunity where you might not have known that it exists. So we definitely think, you know, our lab is 100% aligned with the civil rights perspective. Um, and we definitely hope that our tools are going to make it possible for people to have sort of more different kinds of demonstration maps that show you configurations with a strong voice for communities of color, for um, various minoritized groups that you might not have found um, if you didn't have that kind of algorithmic assistance. So. Um, so thank you so much for answering all of that and for for all the work that you do for fair redistricting. Um, I know we're so grateful here in Virginia and I'm sure all of the other states trying to move along through this process are grateful as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time, Moon. Sure, yeah, it, it's really, you know, it's, it's a great pleasure to have found a place where I can do work that's got scholarly and research depth, 
but that's also actionable um, for people to secure kind of better representation. So I would just encourage anyone listening to this to look up our work and to reach out and contact us because we really enjoy working with community groups um, and we'd love to hear from lots of your listeners. And we'll make sure to have links and information. We'll make you very easy to find. That sounds great. All right, thank you so much.